and I thought it was a complete game. We didn't we didn't do everything right, but we led with our defense. Um, we shared the ball, we made shots, and that's you know we had a total team effort. The men's team got back on track with a win over Tulsa, snapping its four-game losing streak. Plus, we'll break down how the men's team recently lost a record that held for almost eight years. I'm Brielle Barry, live from the Leah Cora Center, where the news isn't all good. The women's team lost its fourth game in a row. We'll take a look. Courts in session is live, and it starts right now. Hello and welcome into a new edition of Courts in Session. She's Emily Cochran and I'm Luke Milai. The Owls are back in the win column, snapping a losing streak without a key contributing player. We found out about an hour prior to game time that Caliph Battle would not suit up. This meant a team trying to break a four game losing streak would have to do it without their leading scorer. Yes, Battle is the team's leading scorer at 18 points per game. You couldn't find battle, but it was hard to miss the dozens of mascots that showed up for Hooters birthday on Sunday. On the first possession of the game, Zach Hicks kicks the ball to Nick Jordan for the three. Sam Griffin gets the ball for Tulsa here and makes the jumper to put the team up by one. He had 16 points on the day. With about 530 left in the half, Temple with the ball, Jordan gets it to Kurjan Cooch for the layup. Tulsa's ball, Josiah McWright with the turnover here. Damian Dunn races to get possession of the ball right here and takes his time on this layup to put the Owls up by six. In the second half, Tulsa with the ball. Brandon Betson with the assist. McWright sinks a deep three from the corner. Now on the other side of the court, Jaleel White with the spin move right here to put the Owls up 48 to 39. White had eight points on the day. Tulsa Sam Griffin seems to always have the ball in his hands. He skids past Temple for the easy layup right here. Heiser Miller had himself a day as well. Look at this three. He scored 11 points and had nine assists throughout the matchup. Griffin getting it done from the three point line yet again, but at this point, the Golden Hurricane is still down by seven. Dunn was on fire in this matchup. He had 24 points. 12 of them came from the three point line, like the one you just witnessed right here. It's a win for Temple, the best birthday present Cooter could ask for. Final score 76 to 53. I thought it was a complete game. We didn't, we didn't do everything right, but we led with our defense. Um, we shared the ball, we made shots, and that's, you know, we had a total team effort. Um, how good was it to get Ryan in the game towards the end of the game today? It's good. He deserved it. He's been around the program uh, for a while now. Playing without Caleb today, what was that? Hey, you know, I guess did you guys not, I don't know, did you not know until today that he was going to be with you? Or, or? Um, it's just, uh, we're just going to keep that one, you know, between the family, so. So two of the many storylines. Ryan Sayers gets playing time for the first time since being on full scholarship, and Damian Dunn doesn't discuss his missing teammate in Caleb Battle. Now I want to focus on the positives. The guy that was running the point today, Heizier Miller, had a great game, and overall it affected the team's ball movement. A season-high 21 assists for the Owls most since December of 2021. It was the best ball movement in a game they've had this season, and again, it started with Miller. He had nine assists, and he just got everyone involved. Three guys in double figures. Six with eight plus points. Yes, it was only Tulsa, but if the Owls can move the ball like this, it's a positive sign moving forward. Definitely, and a huge conference matchup to break a four game losing streak, and they did it effortlessly without Battle, their leading scorer. Now, Battle is not with the team for personal reasons and did not play in this previous game, and obviously, these personal reasons are not being disclosed to us or the media at the moment. Within the last few weeks, we've seen a lot of inconsistencies with the men's and the women's teams, both teams. And, uh, you know, when the women lost their four key contributing players, they actually went on a three game win streak. So who's to say the men can't do the same thing? But in all seriousness, this Tulsa game is going to hopefully give them some momentum heading into the Cincinnati game with or without Caleb Battle. 
And it's just like the women's team. When some players aren't there, others step up. That's what we saw specifically from the three-point line this weekend for the Owls. Four guys had at least two threes. Damian Dunn, as you mentioned, Emily, had four in the game. Again, this team can shoot with anyone. They've shown it in big wins this season over UCF, over Houston. When they can pass and defend like they did this weekend, along with the shooting, they could, be, they could very well snatch a bye in the first round of the AAC tournament. We'll have to see about that one. At the game on Sunday, Temple Athletics pulled out all the stops, including the red carpet for the 1993 men's basketball team, led by legend John Chaney. Courts in session producer Leah Mandel was at the Leah Chorus Center to catch the reunion and to reminisce on their run to the Elite Eight. Thanks, guys. John Chaney led five of his Temple teams to the Elite Eight during his tenure. But the 1993 team was the most surprising due to the fact that they entered the tournament as the seven seed. Temple picked up wins in the NCAA tournament against Missouri, Santa Clara, and Vanderbilt before falling to the notable Fab Five team of Michigan. A few key players from that team came to the game today to be honored and reminisced on a fun season, but unfortunate Elite Eight loss. We got close to the Final Four, we got to the Elite Eight, and uh, it's a game I thought we, we could have won, but my guys, they stepped up. You know, we played against a good Michigan team and it was up and down game in the balance, and. Uh, you know, it's something to remember. Members of that team, along with John Chaney's family, came out at halftime to be recognized with a huge roar from this packed Temple Leacor Center crowd. The Temple team right now finished off a celebratory day with a 23-point victory against Tulsa, which is their largest margin of victory all season long. Reporting from Leacor Center, I'm Lee Mandel, Al Sports Update. Thanks, Liam. Now, before the win over Tulsa, the losses were piling up for the men. A loss on Thursday to Wichita State still could be the difference in getting an AAC tournament by come early March. We now send it over to the third member of our team to break down Temple's loss to the Shockers. Hey, Brielle. Thanks, guys. Temple was looking to win for the first time since January 28th when they beat UCF. Wichita State came to town in what would be a game filled with runs. Temple jumped out to a 13-8 lead, but then Wichita State countered with a 9-2 run to take its first lead of the game. Temple really struggled offensively in the first half, but the lone bright spot was High Sir Miller, 5-6 for six from the floor at halftime to go along with 12 points. The Shockers completely dominated in the first, out-rebounding Temple 26-11, to and this game really came down to rebounding and Wichita State just shooting better from the floor. Temple got out-rebounded 40 42 to 26. The Shocker shot 46% from the floor compared to Temple's 41% from the floor. And with this loss, and even combined with the Tulsa win on Sunday, the Yaz are tied for fourth in the American with Cincinnati. And as luck would have it, that's who they face on Wednesday. And as for Battle, we noticed he was struggling with his play days before missing Sunday's game versus Tulsa. In the game against Wichita State, he was held scoreless throughout the final 17 minutes. And for the Shockers, Jaquan Walton dropped 21 points, with 15 of them coming from deep. And James Rojas recorded a double-double for Wichita State, 11 points and 11 boards. And now more info on that Cincy game. It's on the road Wednesday night at 7 p.m. on ESPN2. And this is a battle for fourth place in the American. Temple narrowly defeated Cincinnati 70-61 to on New Year's Day. But that's all I have for now from Leah Corps Center. Emily and Luke, back to you in the studio. Thanks, Brielle. So, yes, the top four teams out of 11 in the AAC get that postseason bye. Since he's coming off an exciting win down in Orlando against UCF, just like the Owls, it took some late game heroics to conquer the Knights down the stretch. UCF came back from five down with a minute left, but it was David DeJulius for the Bearcats providing the clutch shot with the nasty crossover and the game winner for Cincinnati, putting them, like the Owls, at 9-6 and six in conference play. It's one of the biggest games of the season, and with the teams battling for postseason seeding, we've got to run back the tape on each <laughs> side. For the Owls, it all starts with the unknown status of Caleb Battle. Yes, so we are unaware of Battle's status going into this next game, but if he does miss the Cincy matchup, it's going to give some other players the option to step up. That includes guys like Damian Dunn, Heisier Miller, and Kurjan Cooch, who all scored in double figures in the team's last game against Tulsa. Dunn hasn't scored 20-plus points since mid-January against East Carolina, and his performance on Sunday is a positive sign heading into this matchup against the Bearcats, who are currently tied with Temple for fourth in the conference. Against Tulsa, Temple as a team shot the best it has all season, specifically in the second half, shooting just over 62% from the field. There's going to be a lot of guys that need to be relied on if Caleb Battle doesn't come back soon this season. 
But now I'm going to look over to Cincinnati. They're a well-rounded team, but it's the offense and three-point shooting that catches my eye. Cincinnati scores the third most points in the AAC this season with just over 77 per game. And they do it because of how well they shoot the three. They're currently tied for second in three-point percentage in the conference, and a lot of that credit goes to Landers Nolly and David DeJulius. These guys are Cincinnati's most effective shooters. They both sit in the top four in the conference in three-point percentage. Now, I've talked and we've talked time and time again about how good of a shooting team Temple is. By the numbers, Cincinnati has been even better. Expect a lot of three-point shots to go up Wednesday night. Now, before we head to the break, got some real good news for one of the good guys on campus. Larry Dougherty, who runs communications for the athletic department, is the 2023 Arch Award recipient from the College of Sport Communicators. This is one of the biggest awards in his field. It's given to the person who has made an outstanding contribution to athletic communications. The late Al Schreier also won this award in 2010. It's time to take our first break, and that's a good time to transition to the women's team. Diane Richardson's squad keeps trending in the wrong direction with only three games left before postseason play. We've dive into the details when Courts in Session returns. Welcome back to Courts in <laughs> Session. The, the women's team was looking to snap a three-game losing streak, but the Cougars were having none of it. 13-0 Houston just three minutes in. Later on, Karanda Perea should be catching passes from EJ Warner with this snag and score. She had nine points for Temple. Back to the paint they go. Brittany Garner puts in two. Temple had 28 points in the paint, outscoring Houston by 16 in that cherry rectangle, with Tariana Gary adding to that total and bringing Temple just a bit closer. Now to the second. Aliyah Nelson, Euro stepping and scoring. A 16-3 Temple run ties things up. Low scoring game into the second half. Brittany Onyege puts the Cougars back up six, but Tiara East responds with one of just two threes in the game for Temple compared to Houston's seven triples. The Cougars push the lead back up to 11, heading to the fourth quarter on this jumper from the elbow. But in the fourth, Gary tried to bring Temple back. She had nine of her 11 in that fourth quarter. But on the defensive end, Temple can't get the stops or the rebounds it needed down the stretch as Tiara Young puts it away for Houston. The comeback attempt falls short. The Owls run out of steam and fall 56 to 48. So if we get down 13 nothing, we got to still fight. And I was proud of them to do that because they did get in there and fight and we got back. We tied it at 16, you know, and then they went on a run and we went on a run. <laughs> it's tough to continue to have really bad third quarters and then end up losing the game. So I was cheering this game, and whether it's a men's game or a women's game, we have to stand around the perimeter of the court and go up into the aisles and cheer until Temple scores. Usually takes one to two minutes. This game, four minutes, and they didn't even score. We had to come down because it was a media timeout. <laughs> Our coach was like, all right, guys, come down. We can take a break now. Like, we'll get back to normal cheerleading on the actual court. But as you can tell, the women's team got off to quite the slow start, and it took them a while to pick it up defensively. Specifically, Inez Piper actually had a really great game. She had six blocks within this single game. And this is the first time this has happened since 2016 when, um, a, when it, during a Penn game. So it was very interesting how that happened. And also, uh, it took them a while, obviously, but it was good that they picked it up defensively in the end. Yeah, they were phenomenal, specifically Piper. I think it's the mask. Ever since she broke her nose, she's been <laughs> on a new level defensively. But the defense was there. The shooting wasn't quite there for, for the women. Only 2 for 16 from three-point range. 0 for 7 in the first half. And they've got shooters on the team. Aaliyah Nelson, Tariana Gary, Karanda Perea. Those three are the best shooters. Add in TR East as well to that group. The Owls need to stretch the floor if they're going to compete. They had a bunch of points in the paint, but they need to hit threes, and there's not many other options on this team other than those three or four players. Two perspectives on this women's team is not nearly enough, so that's why we're going to turn it over to Brielle Barry. It's time to send it over to the <laughs> Leah Cora Center where Brielle Barry is live. Brielle, for this women's team, they've got things to fix on both sides of the ball. Yes, and thanks for not forgetting about me, guys. The
The women's team has three games left in the regular season before the conference tournament begins, and there are three keys that I have broken down that the team needs to execute for the remainder of the season. First one, third quarter defense. In games this season, in the third quarter, the Owls typically really struggle defensively and give up the most points. Against Houston, they gave up 19, and against ECU a few weeks ago, they gave up 18. And the second key for the rest of the season is to get out to quicker starts offensively. Houston got out to that 13-0 start, and it was just really hard for the Owls to counter and get any momentum moving forward. So getting out to quicker starts on offense is huge for these remaining few games. And finally, the Owls must limit their turnovers. 24 turnovers against the Cougars, and it's really hard to win a game when you're turning the ball over on key offensive possessions. Three keys, but all are important. And the Owls look to snap their four-game losing streak when they travel to Orlando and take on UCF. The Knights are 10th in the American with a 10-2 record against conference opponents. And this is the perfect opportunity for Temple to get back in the win column before the AAC tournament begins. But that's all I have for the remainder of the show. Emily and Luke turning it back over to you in the studio. Thank you, Brielle. We're up against a break while the men's team is up against the wrong side of the all-time wins list. Plus, we have some breakdowns from both the men's and women's side. Stick with us. Welcome back. A loss for the women, a win for the men. It's time to break down both. Yes, some extra effort from the women and some crisp passing from the men. Let's take a look at the women's side of things first. Tierra East with the ball. She loses possession right here. Tariana Gary to the rescue, dishes it to Aaliyah Nelson. This is typically her sweet spot, but not in this case. Tariana Gary gets the rebound, misses a shot, but pulls it right here. She comes in for a second rebound here, and in this mix, she is the shortest person. She's 5'6 in the mix right now, and for her to get a second rebound is just so incredibly impressive. You can play it again. She finishes off the shot, scores, and on that possession, it was extremely stressful, and for her to finish in that position is very impressive. And even in the losing streak, that's the effort <laughs> that the Owls have shown throughout. Now, I'm going to go over to the men. Heisier Miller, I already talked about how great his impact was, but I want to show it to you with three different types of plays. First one roller right here. It's a pick and roll with Jamil Reynolds. He draws two defenders, throws a perfect alley-oop, <laughs> and Reynolds gets the easy Ooh. dunk. Now, in a half-court set, Damian Dunn's about to come off this screen. Heisier Miller knows the play. He knows the timing is so important to this play. He's got to hit Damian in stride in order for this shot to be perfect and out of the range of the defense. So you can play it right here. Miller is able to hit down on that outside shoulder for the catch and shoot, able to knock down the three. When you've got a guy like Miller, it makes everyone's lives easier. <laughs> now, fast forward again, no pick and roll, no play drawn up. Heiser Miller says, I'll do it myself. He <laughs> drives by his man. You can play it right here. Draws a couple of defenders in and finds Jaleel White for the easy layup. Heiser Miller can do it in a bunch of different ways. He deserves a lot of the credit for the ball movement in this game. Singling out lots of players today, so why not add some more? Owl Sports Update's Patty Heckard is live at the studio set. Hey, Patty. Thanks, guys. The postseason is about three weeks away. To prepare for the final stretch of games, I'm going to look at players from the men's team and women's team who can make a difference if Temple is going to see a postseason run. For the men's team, rebounds have been a bit of a weak spot. The Owls are ranked eighth out of the 11 teams in the AAC. This is a team issue, but it makes sense to start with the big guys. Jameel Reynolds and Kerr John Cooch need to lead the way as the team's tallest players. John Cooch performed well when Reynolds was out with an injury earlier this season. Both players on the floor together could help the team end its rebounding woes. On the women's side of things, the team has had a tough time scoring as of late. It's been a big adjustment for the team after losing four players in late January into early February. Temple has shot just 13 of 69 from three during its four-game losing streak. Tariana Gary has also struggled as of late, but can bring a major spark from long range when needed. She currently has the second most made threes and the second highest three-point percentage on the team. Both teams have three games left in the regular season, but there's still a lot of time for movement for both teams in the conference standings. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Patty Heckard. Luke and Emily, back to you. Thanks, Patty. There is no arguing Temple basketball in its history of winning. Prior to February 11th, Temple was the fifth winningest men's basketball program in the NCAA. 1,976 wins. But earlier this month, UCLA defeated Oregon to move ahead of Temple on the all-time list. And another school isn't far behind. Syracuse started the week four wins shy of Temple's sixth-place spot with 1,972 wins.
The Owls journey to the fifth spot wasn't all that ceremonious. Back in 2015, an NCAA investigation found that Syracuse used ineligible players in five different seasons. The result? Syracuse was docked 108 wins, the largest number of vacated wins in the history of NCAA. This vaulted Temple with the six most wins up to fifth, where they had stayed until earlier this month. The Owls started the season six wins ahead of the Bruins, but UCLA's 23-4 record this season has launched them over Temple. Syracuse, as mentioned, is only four wins behind Temple. The Owls are likely safe from the Orange this spring, but be on the lookout for another potential change early next season. Now amidst the wins and losses on the court this weekend is some heartbreak that we don't usually discuss on a sports cast like this one. Temple University police officer Chris Fitzgerald was shot and killed Saturday night in the line of duty. This tragedy has shocked the entire Temple community, including head coach Aaron McKee. But after the Tulsa game, McKee touched on what he believes is the unfair perception of how this overall increase in violence overlaps with the Temple community. It's um, difficult. I get upset a lot of times personally when North Philadelphia in particular is in the news. Temple University is in the news. A lot of things happen that's in the proximity, but it's not on campus, but they say Temple University. There are things that happen in West Philly and other places where there's other schools. You never hear them mention those schools, which I think is unfair. Officer Fitzgerald leaves behind his wife and four children. At 4 p.m., a vigil will be held for him at the Bell Tower on Main Campus. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Courts in Session. Only 1% of high school boys players make it to the D1 level. So imagine two guys on the same high school team who not only both end up playing D1 ball, but they also end up at the same school. That's the case for two players here at Temple. Number two, Jaleel White. And number 10, Taj Thweet from the Temple men's basketball team have been best friends for more than half of their lives. We just became friends in like third grade, fourth grade, I want to say. Their transition from friends to teammates took some time because Taj didn't play organized basketball until eighth grade. I would watch him like play basketball, but I just never, I never played. So he'll be like, try out, try out. He just had the athletics and that would make up for all the stuff that he didn't have. When Taj eventually got on the floor, the chemistry between the friends was clear. The two played at Wildwood Catholic High School in New Jersey, winning three Cape Atlantic League titles together. So we just always won since we played with each other. One knows what the other one's doing, um, kind of an innate connection. The two were finally split up in college, with Thweet committing to West Virginia and White coming to Temple. But the distance didn't stop White from recruiting his best friend to the Leah Cora Center. When he was at West Virginia, I was still telling him to come here, like, Every day I was telling him to come here, I was on him about it. When Thweet entered the transfer portal after the 2022 season, White made sure his head coach Aaron McKee knew about it. He called me every day. We watched those guys um, in high school and was recruiting uh, both kids. We got two for the price of one. I always had something in the back of my mind, like when I entered the portal. So I just, I figured like we could run it back. And even with two years of separation, their relationship hasn't wavered. We've been, been together since third grade, even though he was going for two years, like nothing has changed at all. Thweet is red shirting this season due to NCAA transfer rules, but both guys say they are excited to share the floor again next year. Both the men's and women's teams have upcoming games. The men play out to Cincinnati Wednesday night for a 7 p.m. game. You can watch on ESPN2 for that one, but for the women, they're already in Florida prepping to take on the UCF Knights at 6 p.m. This game will stream on ESPN+. And our Owl Sports Update crew is already prepping for another Thursday show at noon. Meg Doyle and Matt Rainier will be back on the desk with some Twitter talk and a look at the postseason bound club ice hockey team. They'll also dive into a free jujitsu program started by Temple football alum Jeff Whittingham with the goal of stemming gun violence in Philly. Uh, my main goal is to give the youth uh, an outlet. Um, they're not really heard or understood. So that's why I come in and uh, try to give them that hope. Again, the full story will be on Owl Sports Update Thursday at noon on TUTV. 
That's all the time we have on this week's edition of Courts in Session. For Luke Milai and Brielle Berry at the Leah Chorus Center, I'm Emily Cochran. Have a lovely day.